changes, and then work is done on an object. So to kind of start it, work. So in physics, physics work is done when an object is displaced by a force. Only the part of the force that is parallel to the displacement does work. So hopefully we kind of remember this formula a little bit from last year or the year before. If I have something and I'm, let's just say I'm holding this and I'm walking this way. Am I doing work on this object? You're out of the frame. <laughs> 3D now, right? Anyway, am I doing work on the object? Yes. If I'm holding it steady like this and I'm walking? No. No, because the force I'm applying with my feet is not parallel to the displacement. But if I push it up, now am I doing work? Yes. yes. Now there is a force parallel. And if you have multiple forces, of course, just add them up, add up all the works, and we could find the network done on the object. Yes. So if you're just holding it and walking. Yeah, because my displacement is in the x direction. Right. But I'm. Oh, but it's your normal force going up. Mm -hmm. So. It's got to be the force has to be parallel. Your arm while you're walking. Then it would only be that motion. Only the displacement. That displacement. Of your arm. Yep. Okay. What about like um, a boat or like an airplane <laughs> where it's like propelling itself? Um. What is it doing work on itself? I don't know. Against the, the air? Against the water? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's like how do the force of yourself? I mean, the only thing that would be doing work would be gravity and the air resistance. What about when you're running? Isn't there a little bit of air resistance? Yeah. It's not real. But you feel the air Yeah, it's not real. We don't talk about Anywho. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Move it and, and it's not like up and down. Wouldn't that object inertia still have an opposite force that you have to push against to make it move? Um. So like if I'm walking and I'm yeah. pushing it. But no, like it's in your hand, but the object doesn't want to move. It's like. Against the air. Like that? Like uh, I'm. <laughs> against the air. Like the air doesn't. Like the air yeah. Yeah. yeah, air resistance. That thing. Like, wouldn't you do work against that? Uh, technically, yes, but I can't think of a reason when that would actually. Can we save this smart question? Like, you're in really thick. Okay, let's keep on going, guys. You're in slime. Okay, guys. So, we have something called the dot product. So when we multiply one vector by the parallel part of another vector, we call it a dot product. Now we're not really gonna get super in depth into it. Um, you may have noticed last year, the formula that we had for work, it was on the formula chart, it had force with a little dot, and then it had delta x for displacement. Now, that dot represents a dot product. All that's telling us is we're multiplying two vectors together, but one of them, we're only taking the parallel part. So we're taking the force parallel times our displacement. And so in this case, if we have a force at an angle of theta, it'd be force cosine theta times the displacement. And so we call this the dot product. Because when you write it in a vector form, we're going to use a dot as multiplication. 
So really all, whenever you see that dot there, all that means is that we're taking the, a component of a force. So in this case, we're taking the component of the force that is parallel to the displacement. Yes. Is it actually called that or is that just what you're calling it? So, <laughs> <laughs> so the process to take a component like this is the dot product when you're multiplying vectors. What if somebody uses an X for multiplication? X then it would be a cross product. Which we talked about. What, it's just multiplication. What if you use parentheses? <laughs> <laughs> Next so, slide! You guys will go more in depth into dot product um, in calculus, but as far as we need to know is it's just basically multiplying the component of a vector. Right, so it's just The next slide. So, yeah, like the parentheses you used before, that's still a dot product. So you can just think it, it's still just multiplying, but it's a special thing you're multiplying, is what it means. But that's a really trivial thing to call this. Wait, got it. It comes a little bit more when in calculus there's other things we use it for. Yeah, but this is... C. Yes, <laughs> and that's as far as we talk about it. You'll see it with the dot instead of an X. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Why not? Hey, gravity's not in the calculus. Everybody here should have done pre calculus. Okay. Parker knows pre calculus really well. Yeah, this is pre calc stuff. No, she's done. Look, what did I say? She's done. Anyway, it's not multiplication. Okay. So the SI unit from work is I can't a dual. silence it if she doesn't speak. Hey, guys. So the unit for work is joules, which is a product of newtons times meters. So one joule is the energy expended when moving an object over one meter force or one meter distance using one newton of force. So one joule of work is done when you apply one newton of force over one meter. Release what? Or air resist effect what? Release um, stuff. That we'll talk about that a little bit later. Is there like an equation for air resistance? We covered that. Because you just told yeah. me it's not we'll, real. We'll talk about terminal velocity. And then a little bit of air resistance stuff to go with it. Air Okay, so work is a scalar. Oops, I thought it so it has no direction. If okay, so negative work does not mean work is to the left. It means that the force is acting in the opposite direction from the displacement. And then if the force is perpendicular to the displacement, the work done is zero. Because cosine of 90 degrees, for example, is zero. So then you would have zero work. That's not a way to think about it. You take into account the angles. Wind. If you're 
you're pushing like, <laughs> like like if I'm pushing a wheelbarrow, let's say for example, and there's wind going in this direction, what's the work done by the wind? Yeah, you'd have work done by the wind. Because it's helping you, right? No, 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 like what if I'm pushing a wheelbarrow this way and there's wind coming at oh. me? So yeah, that would so be negative? the work would be negative, yeah. Then how is it, how is it a scalar then? Would network be positive though? If it's moving in that? Yeah. But wouldn't the work applied by the wind be not? Oh, it's kind of interesting. Like there's two separate, there's two separate like, like, works being done. Not, yeah, so there's like the work of the wind work. pushing you and then you're doing work yeah, against it. It's just working the other direction. Would it yeah. slow so me down? Really Isn't that what like all vectors are though? Negative position is just position in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Because we're specifically constraining ourselves to the uh, parallel portion of it, we wouldn't have like a perpendicular portion. But when we talk about vectors, we can talk about all 360 degrees, mm -hmm. but we're only talking about the direction of, specifically of the displacement. But like, yeah. why is it cosine theta? Why can't, or like, what's the math behind cosine? Because like, it, it makes kind of sense, but like, why is it cosine uh, instead of like anything other? Why is it cosine 90 equals zero? No, no, but like why is work equal to um, force parallel times cosine theta times x? I'm not sure. Because usually we're talking about like where the angle placement is, and so we would use cosine because cosine would be the adjacent, and so that would be the direction oh. of displacement. Because sine would then be the perpendicular part. But we'd be given situations where we wouldn't use cosine, right? Like, like if we had an angle. Yeah. It, like it wouldn't make sense if we were like, I'm pushing something at an angle like this, but I measured the angle from the ceiling to my hand. Like, wouldn't we just measure this angle instead? Like, that would make more sense. Yes. Now, technically, they could give you something like that, but it wouldn't really make sense that the reasoning behind it. That would be like geometry. You would have to find. So then you can actually figure out and make it go some anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's an example. So we have a student that pushes a 10 kilogram box across the floor 10 meters by applying a force of 80 newtons. The coefficient of friction between the box and the floor is 0.2. How much work does the student do on the box? And then how much work does friction do on the box? So. Work is the force that's parallel times the displacement. It's moving in the x direction. So the work is parallel time, the force is parallel times the displacement. And that force that is parallel is what? Which force? Force applied. The force applied. We're applying that force to get its move. So that applied force times the displacement will give us the work done by the student. And so we know that force applied is 80 newtons. We know it went 10 meters, so 80 times 10. We get work done by the student of 800 joules. Gotcha. You know. Now the second part is how much work does friction do on the box? So once again, work is force parallel times the displacement. But now we're looking for the force parallel, which is the friction. What is Friction force. What what is the equation we use? Uh, mu times the normal. Mu times the normal. So in this case, friction is going in which direction? Left or right? Left. Left. So are we going to plug in force that is negative or positive? Negative. 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 So negative mu times normal force times our displacement. It gave us mu is 0.2. And our normal force, we know the box is 10 kilograms, so what is our normal force? 100, because it has to equal the force of gravity here. There's no angles, so they have to be equal. Gotcha. So plug that in, and we get the work done by friction is negative 200 joules. Um, see. So the net work would be 800 minus 200? Any questions on that one? Pretty straightforward. <laughs> That's what we've done already. He's so impatient. He is.
You can't watch right now. Yeah. Yeah. Make him do the test. Make him do the info cue for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> yes, you are. Anyway. Hey, we're all failing. Yay. Yeah, well, your bachelor was in here. You didn't think it was so easy. Okay. So, next, let's talk about kinetic energy. Do you guys remember what the formula is for kinetic energy? One half mv squared. So remember, an object in motion is said to have kinetic energy. You can think of kinetic energy as how much work it would take to bring the object to rest. And the formula, if you remember, is one half mv squared. Yeah. Where is that formula derived from? We'll talk about. Okay. It's coming up. Actually. Save your questions for later. Shut up. Kinetic energy is change in work, right? Work is change in kinetic energy. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was close. Yeah. It's been a while. Okay. So the units for kinetic energy are also joules, which are equal to kilograms times meters squared per second squared. Um, really, all we need to know is that the units of kinetic energy is in joules uh, because the units. A little confusing because we get so much on here, but yes, technically it is kilograms times meters squared per second squared. <laughs> no, they're broken, like usual, so they're trying to fix it. Wait, what happened to the bathroom? Uh, students. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not wrong. wrong. Okay, so kinetic energy is a scalar. So kinetic energy has no direction associated with it, so you should never say kinetic energy to the left or to the right or anything along those lines. Because kinetic energy can never be negative. Mass cannot be negative, and if you have any negative velocity, you square the velocity, so you always get a positive value out of that. So you're always gonna have positive kinetic energy. Would that make it easier? Is my first question. Just then you have another plane, which is one thing you know. It's not that thing. But imaginary numbers is not another plane. Like, imaginary numbers is its own thing. I know, but like another, another math plane. Plane. It's not like the z-axis or something like that. Ours is in a whole other realm. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> or the fifth dimension. Like, like, like you just given a two D motion problem, you want to graph it in three D. Yeah. Why? Because. Or maybe you just have um, one axis to be the x and the other axis to be i, and then you can just have this. <laughs> <laughs> one axis is just a just Okay, so this leads into the network energy theorem. So work is equal to our force times our displacement. So that hasn't changed. We know that Newton's second law is what? F net equals ma. So we can combine these two together. If we combine these two together, we get that our work is equal to mass times acceleration times our displacement. 
So we just plug in for net force there. Now, if we were to solve this, do a little bit of rearranging and solve for acceleration, we would get the acceleration is equal to the work divided by the mass times our displacement. Once we get that, we go back to the kinematic equations. Well, I'm just kind of showing you where this is coming from. Shucks. So, then if we take a look at the third kinematic equation, remember the third kinematic equation Oops. is V squared equals V naught squared plus 2A times our displacement. If we plug this in for the acceleration here, And do a little bit of simplifying. Oops. We end up with this. So we get that the work, the net work, is equal to one half mv final squared minus one half mv initial squared, which is also the oh. work is equal to change in kinetic energy. Which is the change in kinetic energy. So where this is coming from, where work is equal to change of kinetic energy, is actually coming from the work formula with Newton's second law in the third kinematic, all being combined together. Well, they asked us to like prove that. So they may ask you to derive this, and they would do, if they were to ask you for something like this on an FRQ, this would be one point, this would be one point, this would be one point, and then this would be the final point. If they were to ask. That's terrible. Yeah. How do you derive that through calculus? You don't need to. Why not? Because it would take more steps. But it's more fun that way. No, it's not. It's longer. How about just have to be Yep. So work is equal to change of kinetic energy. So the network energy theorem states that the network done on an object is equal to its change of kinetic energy. So if you have positive work, that means you have a positive change of kinetic energy, which also means the object speeds up. If you have a ne negative work, that means you have a negative change of kinetic energy, so the object slows down. Okay, so an example for the network energy theorem, we have a ball that's released from rest, falls a distance of 10 meters. How fast will it be moving at the end of the drop? So we know that the network is equal to, the, uh, in this case, it's the gravity that's pulling it down, so the work done by gravity. And so gravity is the force of gravity times our displacement. So basically we get the mass times acceleration of gravity times our displacement in the y direction. We know that work, the network, is equal to what? Zero. Uh, not zero. How? You said it earlier. Oh, what, um, change in kinetic energy. Change in kinetic energy. So we know that the network is equal to change in kinetic energy. But our initial kinetic energy is going to be zero because we're just dropping it. So our initial velocity is zero. So basically we're just saying that the network is equal to our kinetic energy final. We know that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. And so in this case, it's final kinetic energy. So it's one half v final squared. And our network is equal to mg times our displacement. So now we just need to solve this for final velocity. 
So if we rearrange to solve for final velocity, and then we plug in our values. So our displacement's 10, our acceleration of gravity is 10, and when we solve for our final velocity here, we get the square root of 200 or 14.14 meters per second. Any questions on that? So that is with work and network energy theorem from AP1. Now, since we don't really have too much time, on Thursday I'll go over what happens if, you know, like in this case, your force is constant, right? Force of gravity is constant. When force is not constant, then we have to go into calculus. And so we'll go over that on Thursday. So I'm going to move things around a little bit then, I guess. Um, why do I feel like he's not going to be able to get out? <laughs> Probably not. Anyway. So uh, that's it for the notes today. And then, uh, like I said, on Thursday, we will finish up these notes. And um, I'll also, I already put up a practice, but I'll just give you guys Thursday to start. Cupid's corner. Cupid's corner. Is that what he's going to name the YouTube channel? Cupid's corner. Is this like a bad joke? No, no. Okay. I don't know if that's one of So. On Tuesday, we left off with the network energy theorem. And so, basically just review from AP1, nothing has changed, work net is equal to our change of kinetic energy. Nothing changed there. And then, this thing just has to work today. Then I went through this example, and that's where we left off on Tuesday. So now, Wonder if your force varies with position. So everything we talked about for work in uh, was basically work for AP1. So we had constant forces. So everything we talked about, our net work is equal to our, uh, our change in kinetic energy and all that, that only works for constant forces. Now we won't have constant forces. So many times in physics, a force is going to vary as an object moves. So things like spring forces. So as the spring compresses or stretches, that force is going to vary. Gravitational forces. The closer you get toward the center of the planet, for example, your gravitational force is going to change just a little bit. Electric forces. The farther you are from what's generating an electric field is going to vary the force. So if the force is not constant, we cannot calculate work as the force times displacement. So basically, do not use that formula unless you know 100% for a fact that the force is definitely, absolutely, without a question, constant. Now, I would say, even though this is AP Physics C, 75% of the time, the force will still be constant. But, that other 25% of the time, if the force is not constant, we need to do a little bit of cutting. Stop. <laughs> Not a middle finger. It was just cute. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so how we calculate work for a non constant force? So we can break up any large displacement into an infinitely num or an infinite number of infinitely small displacements. So basically think of like we're gonna be zooming in to the graph and we're gonna be taking smaller and smaller chunks of it and smaller and smaller chunks of displacements. 
if the displacement is really, really, really small, the force will not change much within that displacement. So we can say if the displacement is infinitely small, the force will not change at all from beginning to end. This means it's effectively constant. So basically what we're going to try and do is, using calculus, we want to theoretically zoom in as much as we can on this graph to where the line is not curved anymore. So we calculate the work done for each infinitely small displacement using the work formula for constant force and add them all up. So, the general formula for work. We add up the infinitely number of infinitely small things, we integrate it. So, work is equal to the <coughs> integral. Bless you. Bless you. I thought that was Aria for a second. Like, that's what it sounded like. I was like, wait, what? Uh, so, work is equal to the integral of the force times the displacement with respect to that displacement. And we have, oh wait, that's right, I have it all set. Hmm? Why is the dx a vector? How would you do that? How would you calculate that with like a vector dot vector integral equation? Uh, well, it's a vector because it's displaced. But how would you calculate the integral of a vector dotted with another d vector? You can multiply two vectors here. So we have that force at position x. Force is going to be constant as the object moves from x to dx. So this is kind of like we're looking at what force is being applied at a very, very small section. So very, very small displacement. dx is an infinitely small displacement. So that is the displacement. Both of these being multiplied together is the amount of work done by the force over that displacement. So we're taking the force being applied over a displacement, just like we would normally, but for a very, very small section of the motion. And then we're going to basically repeat that and just add them all together. So we're going to be using calculus to find that. Because if we were to zoom in on a graph that's curved, really zoom in on there, then we get to a point where it basically looks like a straight line. And so we know for a fact that when you have a straight line, your force is constant. So that's when we can use this. So that's how we kind of get around the rules of force is constant. Not when I'm looking at it like this, but when I'm looking at it like this it is, kind of thing. So the integral symbol here is the sum of all together, all the bits. So when you have values on the top and the bottom here, those represent basically what we call the bounds. We're saying from this initial position to this final position. Okay, now in the past when we've done integrals, we didn't have these bounds because we're saying for the entire thing. Now we're saying within this section of the motion, we want to know what a lot of work is done. Okay. So the X's are called the limits of integration or the bounds, and uh, they tell you where to start and stop the sum.
Any questions on this? So, definite integral. So the expression on the previous slide is what we call a definite integral. Basically, it looks like an antiderivative, which you've already done, but it's not. The difference is the antiderivative is a function, so we were solving for functions before. Definite integral is going to give us a value, it's just going to give us a number. And so, conceptually, you can kind of think of it as definite integral is the sum of an infinite number of infinitely small quantities. So zooming in as small as we can get it and then taking sections and putting it all together. Basically, the idea is we do this just like we would for an antiderivative. And then we just do one more step. So it's what we've done in the past already. We just do one more step. too far into it we just do power rule we do um, we deal with constants we deal with uh, I've never seen like sine or cosine or any of the trig come up so I'm not gonna see like use of, so I'm not gonna have to use like substitution or like not, you're not gonna have to do like substitution by parts or um, uh, Oh, what's that other one that's... Partial fraction. No, not that. What is that? I'm trying to think what that is. There's one that takes forever to do. Is that different than partial fraction? That... It's not integration by parts. It's... I have, I have to double check. But there's one that I remember that takes forever to do, but... Isaac and I are we great at tabular. Tabular myself. Okay, so how we calculate a definite integral. So we find a definite integral by employing the fundamental theorem of calculus. Yay! So basically, what this says is that if f prime is equal to the uh, df over dx then we can say that the integral is f prime dx and between a and b, so between b and b minus a. Basically what I'm saying is f prime is as if we've already taken the derivative of something. So if we take the derivative of a function, now we have the prime. So we have the new function, basically. If we take the integral of that same function, that's already been derived with the derivative, you just revert it back to the original, right? So what this is saying is, if we take the integral of that new function, and we plug in A minus and uh, B to the function and subtract the two, that will tell us what all those little parts added up together is. So we take the beginning and we take the end and we find the difference between them. And so I'll do an example and make a little bit more sense because I know this is kind of confusing in terms of variables here. Uh, but we could say that the sum of the infinitely small changes in the quantity adds up to the net change in the quantity. And so practically it says that calculating the definite integral for some function is as simple as determining its antiderivative.
students. We did complex bullying. And then let's go into uh, the Z axis while we're at it. Yeah. No, I wouldn't doubt if we did that this year. We should do it. At the rate we're going. Okay, so it'll make more sense if we do an example here. So here is our example. So determine the value of the following definite integral. So we have 5x squared, and we're going from 0 to 1. So what we first need to do is we know that 5x squared is the function. So we could say that f prime is 5x squared. So that means what was the original function? So we just take the integral of that. And so since it's power, power rule here, we would bring down uh, 2 plus 1 and then 2 plus 1 in the power. So we would get 5 over 3 times x to the third. That's exactly what we were doing before when we did integrals. And so that means our final function our original function would be 5 thirds x to the third. Any questions on that part? Yeah? If you took the integral of that, what would be like the f of x notation? So if we took the integral of the original function? Mm -hmm. uh, it would. It does have something. I can't remember what it's Is called. It no. It's not prime. It's like, I want to say it's kind of like an inverse prime, but I can't remember exactly what the symbol is instead of putting the little prime. Really, that only comes up. <clears throat> not in this class. Yeah. Uh, it'll come up like uh, if you go higher calculus levels, like past calc 2. Calc BC and we passed that. Because I remember only doing it in one class and then I completely forgot it. Because <laughs> like we never did it again. Because then that starts getting into imaginaries. And so we don't want to deal with that. Okay, no. so we found our original function. Now, because we have some bounds here, we have these limits of integration, what we need to do now is plug in to the function 1 and plug into the function 0 and subtract those two. So basically we have 5 thirds times 1 to the third minus 5 thirds times 0 to the third. And so when we solve that, we just get 5 thirds. And so we get a value out of this. So we, get, we first got to find the original function then we plug in the limits and a value. So that's that extra step, is just plugging in those values. Okay. Just. It's just doing that. Which is what you guys probably do in February. So all you gotta do. Is... Wait, are you talking about the Any questions on that? Imagine not being in stats like me and Aria. But you're in DC now. Yeah, Manning just so. like that. Just a six superior. Okay, so let's look at a physics version. So here we have a particle moving in a straight line. Experience the force given by f of x equals 6x plus 2. How much work would be done by the force if it moved the particle? from position zero to position two. So we're given our function, our force function here, and between zero and two, we want to figure out how much work was done. So what would the equation be for f prime here? Okay, so it would just be the, if we're looking for f prime, f prime is actually just whatever the function is. 
That's not going to be the original function. F prime is just whatever the function is in the problem here. Okay. Then we need to find the original function. So to find the original function, then we integrate it. So if we integrate this, what would we get? 3x squared plus 2x plus c. We got our... Yeah, so that's what I'm going to mention in a second. So officially, we get, maybe, there. Oh, Lord. So we get 3x squared plus 2x plus c. Okay, all right. How much caffeine have you had? Because I feel like you just ripped that open with your teeth. Um, uh, um, no comment. And I'm a little concerned. Just a little worried. Okay, so we get 3x squared plus 2x plus c. Any questions on that? All right, so far. I think I got it. Yes, I'm going to mention what's going to happen. So, now we want to find the work. So, oh, I forgot to put it as one line. Whoops. So, the work function. Shut up. Guys. So, our work function is the definite integral of our original function with respect to x. So, we now found our original function, and we want to go from 0 to 2. So, 0 to 2. Plug all that in. Now, once we have that, now we can plug in that 0 and 2. But here's the thing. If we were to subtract this from this, they both have that constant. So, the constant will just go away. So, we don't got to worry about the constant. I just put it here to let you know that, yes, a constant does come up, but when we do a definite integral, you would subtract it. So they would just go away. Yeah. How does applying 2D motion? How is the what? If the, if the force is instead of just 1D, it's 2D. Uh, so if it was 2D, then you would find the work done in the X, the work done in the Y, and then the bag right there, find the net. How would you do like, the integral with the 2D? Force? Dotted you could do it the exact same way. Okay. So once we plug in the 2 and the 0 and subtract them, we're left with 12 plus 4. So we get 16. Go back. So we get 16 joules of work was done to move it from two, uh, 0 to 2. So all that for 16. Any questions on this? like in AP1. Okay, oops, I forgot. That's actually, I have a review of that coming up too. I'm going to mention it in a second. Yeah. Why did you take 6x plus 2? So, when we do the integration here, what function we put in here is always going to be f prime. So whatever our original function was, well, our function from the problem. So 6x plus 2, so that's f prime, so we're going to plug that in there. Let's do another one here. So we have a spring exerts force on a two kilogram box given by the force is equal to negative two X. The box starts at rest at a position of X equals four. How much work will the spring do on the box as it moves, moves it to X equals two? 
And then what is the speed the box reaches when it reaches that point? So the first, or yes? Is that what the speed is? Uh, no, you wouldn't have to be a book slot in this one. But no, like for future problems, if they just give us this big constant, then you have to do like F is equal to. Yeah, it's basically yeah. giving you a hook's law without actually saying it's hook's law, but okay. yeah, because that's that's why hook's law is, is the next set of things. Which is what we were going to do today, but I had to move everything because so, so, computers had expired. Anyway, the computers have expired. Anyway, so for part A here, we need to find how much work the spring will do on the box as it moves to x equals two. So we're going to take the definite integral. So our function is negative 2x. So if we take the integral of negative 2x, what do we get? So we're going to, so it's x to the 1. So it's going to be, uh, bring down the 2, so negative x squared. Yes. So negative x squared. Then we're going from 4 to 2. Okay. So our initial position is what we put on the bottom. And then our final position is what we put on top. So we're going from 4 to 2. So once we have that, I ran out of room, so that's why I had to have it in one line like this. But um, so we're going to have the four down here and the two up here, because this is our initial and this is our final. We plug in the two, plug in the four, and solve here. Remember the constant ca cancels out. Attention teachers, if you happen to have a tennis player, please uh, allow that student to leave at this time. If you have a tennis player, please allow that student to leave at this time. Thank you. Okay. So when we solve that, we get 12 joules. So 12 joules of work was done. Now that we have this, part B, what is the speed the box will reach when it reaches that position? Well, we just saw for the work. Work is equal to what? Change in kinetic energy. So since work is equal to change in kinetic energy, we already found the work. So that means we can just plug that in to work equals change in kinetic energy. And we're looking for the speed when it reaches that final position. So we can plug in our values and solve for the final velocity. And so we get the square root of 12. So I left it in radical form, but yeah. So square root of 12 is our final velocity. Yeah. Some teachers are making students work too hard and their computers can't keep up. That's the joke. What? You have a lot more though. That's the joke. Okay. Stupid, stupid, stupid. They're not doing their work. They should do their work better. Mainly what it is is when you guys have your chargers that are broken and the cables are exposed and still use them is a problem. Because <laughs> you don't want to pay to replace it. Yeah. Is that, is that needed to Microsoft Office? Yeah, it's called more. More? Sorry. Wow. It's like more Anyway. Okay. So, here's what you were talking about last time. So, this is kind of a refresher. Remember, if you are given a force position graph, we can use that graph to find the work as well. So, when we did definite integrals, we use this function to, um, which is also because of the area between the graph and the function on the x-axis. So basically, we're just breaking this area up into smaller and smaller sections using our definite integral, and that's why we're able to solve it. But if we're given a graph, 
that doesn't have a curve. Like this. Then we just need to find the area under that line. And we can find the work done. So this is just from AP1. So work can be found by calculating the area under the force displacement graph. Technically, this is what we're doing with the definite integral, but it's a lot easier when you just need to one half base times height <laughs> or base times height. And so we had a shape like this and we wanted to find the amount of work done. We find all the values, so I kind of split it into three triangles at the top and two or three shapes at the top and two shapes on the bottom. Because these are negative forces, make sure that they're negative, and we just add them all up. And so our total work done here would be 17.5 joules. We have more positive force than we do negative. So to just kind of sum up everything, so work done on an object causes its kinetic energy to change. It makes the object speed up or slow down by an amount exactly equal to the net work done. If the force doing the work is constant, you can calculate the work by using work is equal to the force times the displacement. Remember that force has to be the force that is parallel to that displacement. So you might need to use something like cosine to actually get that component. If the force is not constant, that is when you're going to use the definite integral and calculate the work done by finding the area under the force displacement graph. Any questions on this guy? Okay. So I do have a practice that I put into your one notes. Um, and then, oh, I haven't changed it yet. But tomorrow we'll do spring forces and we'll do potential energy on Monday.